I want to take a minute. Uh, I think we may have some folks here from Mutual of America. First of all, I want to just give them a uh, round of applause and, and a heartfelt thank you for the opportunity to house this at this event. They do such a great job. Very, very um, patient staff here at, the, at Mutual of America and of course this beautiful room on a beautiful day. Even when it's not a beautiful day, this is a beautiful room and um, lovely views. I also want to take a minute to thank Staples uh, for sponsoring this event today. We're always very fortunate to have um, a, a sponsor and you notice the, hope you get a chance to read some of the uh, posters around the room. Uh, Staples uh, sponsors this event, including uh, the production of those, of those posters. So thank you very much. Keep coming guys to the front of the room. There's uh, many, many familiar faces in the room and I suspect we'll see more and more folks um, coming in as, um, as they make their way up to the 35th floor. Um, there are lots of individuals who have been to a couple of cases, all 14 of our events and then in others um, have come repeatedly and there, it's really great to see a, a, a group of people who sort of continue to be interested in some of the issues that we represent in this solution series. Of course, um, we've covered topics such as the veterans, employment of veterans, uh, leading as women, uh, previously incarcerated and the struggles um, they have in gaining employment, uh, many other topic, topics that have been of interest. There's also a fair amount of new people in the room, which we're thrilled about, and we hope that uh, once you sit uh, and listen to our esteemed panel that you'll become a regular, a regular face. Uh, in the crowd. Um, the topic that we're exploring today is very, very important. It's timely. It's important to FedCap as well. A FedCap was founded by three World War I veterans who themselves had significant disabilities and went on to uh, create an organization dedicated to the advancing of opportunities for people with disability of all abilities, and not just veterans, but of course people with all um, abilities and, and really had with a, with a grounded in work but focused on all that is involved in, in creating a community. So how people lived, how people played, how people um, formed community and with the opportunities they had and weren't just focused on any old sort of meaningless job but rather jobs that could really sustain uh, a family, buy a home. These folks in 1935 were way ahead of their time and pre almost any legislation you can think of, um, but really felt as if um, this was important work and we're very grateful for that. Um, and, and as you'll learn from our distinguished panel of experts today by reading the um, Y book, I hope all of you um, have the opportunity to, to, to read this book. It's included in your packet. Um, it's, it's a great piece of work. It brings together lots of information. I think you'll find it helpful. But one of the themes uh, you'll hear from the panel today and hopefully represented in the book is that hiring people with disabilities is way more than a nice thing to do, the right thing to do. It actually makes incredibly good business. I think this will be um, more and more evident. Uh, hiring people with disabilities, uh, you know, proactively recruiting people, hiring them, retaining people with disabilities. Um, companies that engage in this work are enjoying much more uh, productivity, improved retention. There are so many, um, uh, so many advantages to uh, employing this group uh, the fostering, generally speaking, of diversity in the workplace, I think we don't really need to make the case any longer that it's just darn good for business. It attracts other really smart people as well, and uh, customers prefer doing business, uh, plain and simple, with people who, who are represented, uh, representing a diverse uh, workforce. I would like to introduce uh, a very important person in our community, Martha Jackson. She's the Assistant Commissioner of the Mayor's Office with People with Disabilities. Uh, Martha joined the mayor's office in 2015 uh, to create specifically a business employment agenda based on partnerships, collaborations, and importantly, uh, best practices in terms of engaging the community stakeholders. So we're very, very uh, fortunate to have Martha in that post here in the city. She's also the director of New York City At Work, uh, and this is the first public-private partnership established to create uh, career pathways for employment for New Yorkers with disabilities. So uh, without further ado, Martha, please come to welcome. Thank you, Christine. Good morning, everybody. 
it's really, it's really lovely to be here on this gorgeous yet somber day. And I'm actually very grateful to be amongst your company, the people that are focused, mission driven, and think about and work for uh, improving the lives of all New Yorkers. So thank you for inviting me. I have greetings from the mayor's office and Commissioner Victor Calise. He asked that I send his regards to all of you today and to thank our good friends at FedCap for their commitment to changing lives of New Yorkers through the power of work. He would be here today, but he's actually in The Hague, uh, participating with the New York City Commissioner for the Department of Aging, Donna Corrado, on an international summit on disability and aging. And as I put my glasses on to read my statements, I'm very grateful that that's what he's doing. <laughs> New York City is, and I'm sure you know, the most vibrant, exciting, and diverse city with so much to offer. In July, the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, fondly known now as MOPED, we released the Accessible NYC 2016 report on the state of New Yorkers with disabilities. We released the first one in 2016, and this report, released in July, holds us to the task. What are we doing? The six pillars of our report are housing, transportation, health and wellness, education, access, and employment. And we all know that in order to achieve the first five, employment is crucial. So why is this morning's topic important to people, to business, and to our city? Let's just begin with the current trend in unemployment, with unemployment at 4.8, 4.9%. Businesses seem to be beginning to struggle to meet the current and future workforce demands. The U.S. Department of Labor reports that in 2016, approximately 54 million Americans identified as having a disability. 17.9% of persons with disabilities were employed, and in contrast, the employment population rate for those without a disability was 65.3%. But let's look at New York City. Nearly one million New Yorkers have disclosed as having at least one disability. And the statistics for New York speak for themselves. I won't run through all of them, but I'll just give you a few. Kings County, 78.1% of New Yorkers with disabilities are jobless. Queens County, 75.7%, and here in New York County, 79. So in order to begin addressing the challenges of expanding the talent pipeline and inclusion in the workforce, as Christine said, our office has established NYC at Work. It is the first public-private partnership to increase employment for New Yorkers with disabilities, the city's and the country's largest untapped talent pool. This is a multifaceted approach to building a sustainable pipeline of qualified talent for meaningful living wage jobs in high growth sectors across New York City. NYC at Work was officially launched in April of 2017 and is made possible by the support of the Poses Family Foundation, the Kessler Foundation, thank you, Elaine, Institute for Career Development and the New York State Adult Career and Continuing Education Services known as Access VR. And last week, we received the news that the Nielsen Foundation was supporting our efforts to create a pathway, career pathway, for those with spinal cord injuries. NYC at Work will be grant funded for three years before transitioning to SBS or Small Business Services, ensuring that this does not remain a disability agenda, but rather becomes an integrated part of New York City's workforce. So as a business-driven led initiative, NYC at Work focuses on the supply side. We're building a talent coalition of provider organizations serving New Yorkers with disabilities and have created a coalition of schools, high schools, CUNY, SUNY, private colleges, workforce development agencies, our state, Voc Rehab, and their provider agencies, and community-based organizations. On the demand side, NYC at Work is building the Business Coalition, expanding business engagement and collaborating with the Workforce Development Board and SBS Workforce One Centers to increase opportunities to jobs in a variety of sectors. We have a robust business development council providing us with their expertise and insights while challenging us to help them create real solutions. 
Our council began with seven members 18 months ago, and currently we are at 64 and growing. Let's not forget the role that city government has to play in this equation. We have hired 41 disability service facilitators, we call them DSFs. Currently there are 50 agencies. They coordinate efforts to comply and carry out responsibilities under the ADA and other federal, state, and local laws and regulations concerning accessibility for persons with disabilities and serve as the primary contact within that respective agency for people with disabilities requesting services. We will have DSFs in all 50 agencies. MOPED has created a simple guide and question and answer format for businesses to understand the accessibility waiver process set forth in New York City's building code as part of the Small Business First initiative. We are planning Small Business Disability Awareness Day to introduce small business owners to the needs of New Yorkers with disabilities, making the case to NYC small businesses that making products and services accessible to people with disabilities is not just good policy, it's smart business. This event will provide awareness and access to information on best practices and incentives for hiring individuals with disabilities as part of the small business workforce. Now our community is vocal and when they know of a business or company that hires, they tell their families, they tell their friends, their neighbors and their coworkers and provide an expanded customer base for the thousands of businesses in our city. As our commissioner, Victor Calise, always says, we might be disabled, but our money sure isn't. We created a plain language guide on federal government tax incentives provided to businesses to cover the cost of making access improvements for customers with disabilities. This guide has been distributed to SBS and is available on our website. These are just some of the initiatives our office has undertaken in the past year under the leadership of Commissioner Victor Calise and the passionate and motivated staff of Moped. Our mayor has often stated that the people who work for the city should reflect the people that live in the city. Understanding that the D in diversity stands for disability and should be leading the diversity conversation and no longer an afterthought. Our mission at Moped is to make New York City the most accessible city in the world with access to transportation, housing, education, culture, and the arts, to sports and the waterways, and to the best in health care, <clears throat> excuse me, and government services for all. But in order to achieve that, a person needs access, excuse me, <clears throat> access to internships, to summer jobs, to an entry level position, a career pathway, to becoming a manager and becoming leadership, and to having a seat in the boardroom. Is this possible? We believe with business in the lead, it is not only possible, it is inevitable. And we hope that you believe like we do, that at work, it's what you can do that matters. And now, Lori Lutz. Thank you. Martha, thank you so much. Wow, this is a very, very active city and this topic is germane for where we are in 2017. Um, about a month ago, Forbes magazine had a headline that said this, Business Next Frontier, People with Disabilities. And it went on to say that according to Forbes, people with disabilities represent experience, perception, perspectives, talent that is um, only advantageous to the workforce. And I want to give you a couple of figures. It starts out by saying that people with um, disabilities represent 1.3 individuals across the country, across the world. 2.3 billion family members, friends, caregivers, colleagues wrap around those individuals with disabilities, amounting to $8 trillion in buying power. It's absolutely time for business for government, for nonprofits, to consider the ways in which people with disabilities can advance and enhance our workforce. And to talk with us about that today are three panelists, and I've been so excited about this panel because as some of you who have attended these sessions before know that I get this opportunity 
to spend some time chatting with them a lot beforehand. And I think you'll find them intelligent, passionate, and committed to the issue. So I want to begin by introducing Elaine Kotz. Not only has Elaine, as the Senior Vice President for Grants and Communications, been a driving force in letting over $38 million in grants um, on this topic. She's had personal experience of 25 years supporting nonprofits. She's written articles on social enterprise. She's pre presented on numerous panels on innovative practices in hiring people with disabilities. She's on multiple boards of directors, all advancing the employment of people with disabilities. Um, she is the first recipient of the Jackson Drysdale Civilian of the Year Award from GI GoFund and the 2015 Betty Pendler Award for Improving the Lives of People with Disabilities. Will you join me in welcoming Elaine? We also have on our panel Amanda Tierney, and Amanda is going to give us that boots on the ground perspective, and I think you'll see that immediately when you start chatting with her. She goes to work every single day looking for ways to advance the employment of people with disabilities at CVS, where she serves as a regional learning center manager, and she's going to talk about some highly innovative ideas in sector-based training and employment. I think you'll really enjoy what Amanda has to say. And so join me in welcoming Amanda. And finally, we have Larry Stubbefield, who is the Assistant Administrator of the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Civil Rights. And in that role, he does um, whatever he can do, and you'll learn that to push inclusion and diversity in the federal government, in the Small Business Administration, and the small businesses around um, the country. But in addition, Larry spent 40 years in the military. I'm sure you still view yourself as a soldier. The last 10 years of his life was um, he served as the Assistant Secretary of the Army's Diversity and Leadership Office. And there he drove policy, he drove practices, he drove formulation and decision making around inclusion of people with um, diversity and uh, people with disabilities. And I think you'll find when I started to talk with Larry the very first time, and I thanked him for serving on our panel, and he said, no, thank you. Thank you for sponsoring a topic that has such meaning to me. And um, it, was, it was powerful to me. So with that, please join me in welcoming Larry, and we'll dig in. So Elaine, we're going to begin with you. The Kessler Foundation is dedicated to finding employment solutions for people with disabilities. And as I indicated, $38 million of grants have been awarded just since 2005, all focused on this, um, laser focused on this topic. So what have you learned? What do you know that can help individuals and the businesses in this room advance people with disabilities employment? Thank you, Laurie. First, I'd like to say it's my pleasure to be here. It's great to see so many people so early in the morning. So we're really excited to be on this panel. Um, you know, there are many best practices that we've learned over the years through our grants. Um, and as you well know here, I may be preaching to the crowd, hiring uh, people with disabilities is good for business. Um, it's seen by Walgreens and others that it can result in higher productivity, lower turnover, better safety records. What I'd like to do this morning is give you a preview of a national survey that we're releasing uh, next week in Washington, D.C. Uh, on the Hill. Um, it's the 2017 National, uh, Kessler Foundation National Employment Survey of Supervisors. And it was designed and analyzed by the University of New Hampshire. And we looked at, um, we surveyed 3, 000, over 3,000 supervisors of people with disabilities <coughs> from a business to business panel that was conducted by Qualtrics, which is the data company. We looked at three distinct areas, recruiting and hiring, onboarding and training, <coughs> retention and accommodation. And within each topic, we looked at the commitment to employees with disabilities, their practices, and we also had an opportunity to ask some open-ended questions. So a couple of points really stood out, um, and I think uh, one of the boards here talks about that as well. Um, we found that super, what supervisors look at and their importance on hiring people with disability per, is matched and perceived by what they think upper management is giving the message to them. 
So, you know, when we oftentimes see that um, changes in culture and corporation come from the top. And even though it may not be a top-down management company, when you look at cultural changes and hiring with disabilities, it still comes from the top. So even if we've seen in some of our grants, even when there's a manager who wants to hire people with disabilities, their department may do it, they may do a great job, but it's not permeating throughout the company unless it gives that you know, okay from the executive team. Also, when you're looking at recruiting people with disabilities, 27% um, of the supervisors surveyed identify their company as partnering with a disability company to help them onboard, recruit, find those people, get them settled in the job. Um, so that, that's a pretty long number. But the result was 91% of those companies found the practice effective. So when companies partner with organizations like FedCap and some others in the field, they really do find it gives them a lot of assistance getting those people jobs. And uh, companies like CVS has found that, Amazon, JetBlue, Walgreens, Petco, Syntas, more and more companies are going into the community and partnering with those agencies. We had a project with Pepsi's America Beverage and uh, their nonprofit partner, Ability Beyond in Connecticut. And they branded something called Achieving Change Together, Pepsi Act. And what that was, was a company-wide initiative to hire people with disabilities. They even created a special portal. And although it, for legal reasons it wasn't exclusive to people with disabilities, HR managers knew that when they got one of those applications that came through the portal, most likely it was somebody with a disability. So our survey backed up a lot of these findings that we saw. When, when supervisors were trained in accessibility and how to interview, how to relate to the employees, how to onboard them, it was really, really effective. So again, you know, when, when companies use techniques like job shadowing, flexible work benefits, it really benefited everybody. Um, there's a high correlation between helping those employees and doing a good job. So again, um, we didn't study the practices of how this helped people without disabilities, but you can just imagine, when you have an inclusive culture and you help everyone, it helps everyone. Thanks, Elaine. So let's pull out what some of the key pieces. There has to be leadership from the top. There has to be a really strategic approach to how we recruit the use of technology and the advancement of certain kind of portals, and an interviewing process that really does embrace individuals with disability and allowing them to you know, optimally show themselves in the interview process. I think I want to pull those elements out because I think they're immediately applicable, and that's our goal, right, to create solutions. So Amanda, um, when we were talking, I was intrigued by your sector-based approach. The idea that you establish training centers in a variety of places, sometimes inside schools, and Amanda will talk about that, to actually advance people's readiness to work inside the CVS culture and in many other cultures. So I wonder if you could talk about what you do boots on the ground every day. Definitely. Thanks. First of all, thank you all for having me today. Um, I wanted to start off, and before I go into the mock store concept that we do currently, uh, just to kind of brief you on the department that I work within within CVS Health. So I work within the Workforce Initiatives Department. Um, our fearless leader is Ernie Dupont, previously Steve Wang, as a few of you may know. Um, and with our department, um, I'm one of two individuals, my colleague Joanne is in the crowd who work and cover the five boroughs and partner with various community-based organizations, schools, agencies that help individuals um, that have disabilities or youth, veterans, mature workers. So from a standpoint of our department, those are our four main focus groups that we have, and then of, they're not limited to that. So uh, when we look for agencies and community-based organizations to partner with, you know, if someone says it's a disability-focused organization, the question never is, well, what kind of disability? Um, we like to partner with everyone to try to figure out the best approach that we can help you with on connecting to employment. Um, and just providing a great experience for individuals as well, and we hope that they want to stay at CVS, so that is the goal. Um, but I wanted to talk to you today mainly, in which I spoke with Lori about our mock store concept. So 
I'll tell you a, a brief story of last, of what the past year has held. So uh, a few months ago, I would say actually this time last year now, my colleague and I met with the District 75 school job developers. Uh, and we've partnered with District 75 in the past. And for those of you who don't know, District 75 is mainly the um, disability-focused schools across the five boroughs. Um, we've partnered with them in the past through a work experience program, so individuals from the schools have been selected to participate in what would be called an internship in the CVS locations for a certain period of time. We work out that period of time with the school on what works best for the individuals and their school schedule. So when we met with the individuals from the school, we had a job developer from a school in Brooklyn approach my, my colleague and I and say, I love the work experience program idea and I would love my students to do this. Um, however, I just don't think my students would be ready to go directly into a store. I wish there was an in-between or something else that we could do. So my colleague and I initially thought of the fact that we have a CVS mock store in the building that we work in, in Lower Manhattan. So we showed the job developer that mock store location and it looks just like a CVS store when you walk in minus the customers. So there's real products, real registers, fake money and credit cards, but they work. Um, and coupon center, everything that you would see walking into a CVS location. And she said, I love this, but it's a little bit far from our school. Just come by our school and you'll see. So we went to the school um, and it is P373K. It's called the Brooklyn Transition Center in um, Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn. And as soon as we walked in, we were just completely blown away. So if you've never been to this school, you have to go there. When we walked through the school, we you know, saw the students and how excited they were and everything that they were doing. And there were times when we went into schools and organizations and we saw individuals who um, you know, we're doing tasks and learning some things, but this school took it to a completely next level. So they modeled most of their classrooms after real life concepts. So there's a classroom that's a laundromat, there's a classroom that's a grocery store. And we decided that we would bring the mock store to them. So we asked them if they had some space, and they did. And we were able to build a CVS mock store. The, the school calls them learning labs. We're fine with either, either name inside the school. So in, we started maybe like 10 days after the initial meeting, uh, having a moving truck bringing in fixtures. And we did have to you know, speak to our supervisor and get approval. And every time we speak to anyone, we are just like, you have to see this school. Um, so that's our mock store concept. We did our grand opening in March. And this, the, it was a tough uh, time of year for a school to initially start a brand new classroom. So this will be their first full year. So what we're hoping to get out of this classroom in particular is as soon as the teacher deems students ready for an internship, Joanne and I will meet with the students. We will interview them to make sure that they feel comfortable and actually want to do a work experience program in a CVS store transition over to a CVS location, take everything that they learned from that classroom and implement it in a real life setting. And then from there, the goal for us is that we're able to support that individual in getting hired by CVS. I loved that absolutely um, immediate applicable approach to um, starting early and really creating readiness for young people. And um, under Olmstead legislation, from age 14 on, there is a requirement that people with disabilities are really supported in their transition, not transition to another adult system, but transition to employment, transition to college, transition to integration. So I loved hearing the story. Larry, Larry's going to put us um, a little bit um, more national perspective. And I, this is a question that I've been you know, pondering as you and I have been talking in our readiness. Um, the, when you think about it, the ADA was established with the expectation that people with disabilities would have full inclusion. Today, there are 40 million people in the United States that have disabilities, which is about 12.6% of the population. And um, significant high percentage of individuals um, that are unemployed, actually only 28.3% as of May are working. And they struggle with poverty. So what is the US Small Business Administration doing to change these statistics, Larry? Thank you for the question. And I'd like to start, first of all, by thanking FedCap for inviting me here today. 
anytime you can get out of Washington, D.C. and come to <laughs> the great city of New York, it, it's, it's a good thing. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the federal government at large. <laughs> um, if you don't know it, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has oversight over uh, all employment activities for all of the federal agencies. And so earlier this year, um, they amended Section 501 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act to add in two goals. Uh, goal number one being that every federal agency uh, will have a goal now of bringing on 12 percent of the total workforce will have a, a disability. And then the second goal is, and it's a subset of the 12 percent, 2 percent of the workforce will have what we call a targeted disability. A targeted disability, uh, here are some examples, you know, deaf, blind, uh, loss of limbs, um, uh, missing extremities, partial or complete paralysis, uh, intellectual disabilities, uh, significant psychiatric disorders, you know, bipolar disorders, and so forth. So those are targeted disabilities. And to uh, realizing that that 2% uh, has always been there, the 12% is what's new. But realizing that the 2% is sometimes hard to do because a person with a targeted disability may or may not have, um, you know, problems performing routine things such as eating, going to the restroom, and things of that nature. So the, the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, we call them EEOC for short, has also authorized uh, every federal agency to bring on what we call personal assistance services. In other words, there'll be a person here, not to necessarily help do the job, but to assist the, the person, the um, employee with a disability in doing, you know, some of the routine functions that, you know, that we take for granted, like I said, eating, going to the restroom, traveling, and, and, and things of that nature. So how are they going to put a little bit of teeth in, in the new requirements? We're, every federal agency is going to be required to uh, submit an annual affirmative action plan. And this is what positive proactive steps are we taking to bring on um, more individuals with disabilities. How are we, what are we doing to get to that 12% goal and how are we approaching the 2% goal for targeted disabilities? So in the SBA, uh, realizing that we've got one year now, they, they, uh, the rule change was announced in January and it goes into effect January 2018. So what we're doing in the SBA is we're starting with our managers and supervisors and we're educating them on the, the, that this is, about, this is about talent management. This is about recruiting, hiring, developing, and retaining talent. I think all of us in this room we're all in agreement that there are some, some tremendously talented folks who have disabilities who, if they want to work, should have the opportunity to enjoy the, the, the privilege of uh, being employed. So we're educating our managers and supervisors. And here's another one that I've wrestled with for years. And you know, in the federal government, there's various hiring authorities. And one hiring authority that's kind of like a no-brainer for me is the Schedule A hiring authority. And Schedule A, and I see a few of you nodding your heads if you know what the Schedule A hiring authority is. Most uh, hiring authorities are, are competitive in nature, but with a Schedule A hiring authority, you can bring on a, a qualified person with a disability in a non-competitive fashion. So on one hand, we have uh, managers and supervisors uh, you know, recruiting, and then sometimes it takes up to five, six, sometimes nine months to bring a person on board. But you can bring a person on board with a disability overnight. So we're we're getting the work uh, managers and supervisors uh, familiar with the Schedule A hiring process, and that's also working with our HR staff. And then the the third thing during uh, October, for example, this is uh, National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Uh, we highlight our um, employees who have disabilities um, 
And I want to just tell you that to get to where we want to go, we, we've got to have some success. And we've got to highlight our success stories. And I can give you a few from the SBA, but I'll just tell you about one uh, young man uh, in particular. His name is Daniel Burke. Daniel Burke is, uh, is a deaf employee at SBA. He's a contact specialist. And what he does is using video relay services, you know, he, he's our outreach to Americans around the country who are deaf. You know, he uses this video relay uh, service to tell them about the SBA and what services we provide for people who are deaf who may want to create and start their own businesses. Now, how do we uh, communicate with uh, Daniel? Uh, there's a device, I guess it's called the Ubi Do. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know, but I see a few of you nodding your heads, you've seen that before. But it allows us to use technology, assistive te technology, uh, where we just, using a keyboard, we, we just write to him and he writes back to us, back and forth. And I, I'll tell you, by bringing him on board, this has gone a long way for the people in the headquarters in terms of busting the myths the fears and the stereotypes associated with employing people with disabilities because Daniel is a vital part of what our administrator is trying to do in her outreach to, that, to the deaf, deaf community. So we've got to work on, on breaking myths, fears, and stereotypes, and we do that through success stories. Mm. Thank you so much. So Larry's added to the picture not only the idea of um, educating managers about ensuring that the um, people with disabilities are just a natural part of the organization and that they become the vehicle to try to bust myths, and try to bust stereotypes. So Elaine, you and I talked about the idea of um, myths and barriers and stereotypes. And I'm wondering if in your grants, you have seen really precise practices that have two things, practices that you've seen, and what are some of the myths and barriers that you think are most prominent that we've really got to, we've got to take care of? So one of the most common barriers, and we saw this in a survey too, is, is um, around the cost of accommodations. So companies think it's going to cost a lot of money to bring on and hire somebody with a disability. And in fact, most of them are less than $500, $200. Um, a lot, well, the majority are under $1,000, and in fact, many of them are free. So how many people in your office right now have standing desks, which is kind of the latest thing? You know, how many people have special mouths or special lighting? We do this all the time for our employees, so why should it be any different um, to provide, you know, a special kind of software for somebody with a disability to be able to do their job? Um, another accommodation and uh, practice that could help a business uh, with somebody with disabilities, a work opportunity tax credit. There are credits actually that businesses can apply for for hiring somebody with a disability. Businesses can sometimes tap into um, on-the-job training grants, which may be state or federal, uh, partnerships with local vocational rehabilitation organizations. There are many, many ways that you can tap into what's out there to get trained workers to help people come onboarded and enter your businesses. I would say one of the major barriers that we've seen in our client thinking is where do you find the people with disabilities? That's probably the most common question that organizations have. I want to hire, where do I find them? Um, many uh, people with disabilities are affiliated with local community agencies, uh, with the state vocational rehabilitation groups. Um, but sometimes there's barriers in those groups as well. One of the main ones is they can't always react as quickly and find people as quickly as you would need them for your job. So, you know, sometimes a little bit longer time, and by the time they find somebody, you might have filled the position already. Um, another barrier may be that, um, you know, finding the candidates for the job openings um, for people who are not affiliated with the government. There are plenty of parents who don't want their children on Social Security disability. Um, they're just staying at home. How do you tap into them? That, that one's a little more tricky, but again, community partners can help you do that. Lastly, in our grant making, we're, we focus mainly on innovation, those innovative solutions that can push the needle on employment. And we're seeing staffing agencies that are being started for people with disabilities. The most uh, biggest one right now is a veteran service network run by Easter Sills in the greater Washington, D.C. area, which uh, we were one of the funders for that. They've hired over 1,000 people, gotten people jobs um, who have
have our returning service members with and without disabilities. So this incredible talent within the communities, lots of solutions, and if you're really determined to hire people with disabilities, there's always a way that you can overcome the missing barriers and do that. So a lot of eyes go up at the idea of a focused staffing agency. I, when I talked um, to Elaine as we were preparing, that's a follow-up immediately on, um, on my to-do list. Manda, you had thoughts about the same um, concept of barriers and, and breaking um, myths. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we um, come across a lot in CVS, especially when we initially go to partner with an organization, is the question of job coaches. We're super welcoming of a job coach being in the store to help an individual, but one, we wanted to take it a step further. And you know, in order for that candidate to be successful and hopefully connect to employment, we need the job coach to be successful as well. So we actually do conduct a training for job coaches. Um, it's a quick training, usually an hour and a half to two hours the job coach can come back again and ask questions and do it again if necessary. But we go over how to read our shelf label, our customer service, you know, what to do in a typical situation in CVS. Maybe a customer has a coupon that's expired. So um, in order for the job coach to know the CVS practices and everything that we do, they're able to be more comfortable and therefore help the individual in a better way when they come across a situation in a store. Um, and in addition to that, we also get the question a lot of limiting job coaches and things like that, but we would never really, we've never come across a situation where we ever had to say, like, that's too many job coaches. Why not? The end, they're there to help you, and if the job coach is unable to be there, we expect that our store team jumps in and helps other colleagues, just like they would with anyone, not just a person with a disability. I love that because I know that um, we have encountered several large um, corporations that are struggling with multiple job coaches inside their physical plant, and that kind of flexibility was really intriguing to us as we were um, contemplating how to succeed. So that was great, Amanda. Thank you. Larry, when um, we were talking in preparation, you um, created a phrase that I thought tied to this issue of, of myths and barriers. You reference the seen and unseen aspect of disabilities, and, and even just the whole general push toward inclusion, um, and that workplace diversity no longer is just race and gender and ethnicity, but we now are formally talking about inclusion, um, work, workplace diversity, including mm -hmm. people with disabilities. And I thought your comments were um, compelling. Yeah, I, if, for me, it, it started a couple of years ago, and I was with the Department of Defense. And we hosted a disability uh, employment workshop. We went out to the local colleges and we uh, brought in a number of students with disabilities. And uh, I was paired with a young lady from George Washington University. And I sat there with her for probably at least the first 15 or 20 minutes trying to figure out you know, what her disability was because others had come in and it was, you know, it was quite apparent. And she had epilepsy, you know, and I, I did not know it. In fact, when she first came and, and before we got paired, I thought she was a chaperone. You know, I just automatically assumed that, uh, you know, she was able-bodied and so forth. So this thing about seen and unseen disabilities, you know, became real for me. And, uh, you know, according to the Census Bureau, you know, one out of five Americans have a disability, and it's one out of four people have, have mental illness. So a lot of employers don't even know it, but they're already hiring people with, with uh, disabilities. Uh, you heard in the introduction, you know, I, I, I was around the Department of Defense for a long time, th 30 years in uniform, 10 years in the, as an executive in the, in the Pentagon. I uh, came in uh, as part of the, the Vietnam effort, and I, I can tell you that with the, uh, the advances in medicine and technology, um, you know, soldiers that were injured um, during the Vietnam era, the, the same type of injuries and wounds that, that are occurring now in Iraq and Afghanistan and in other places around the world, soldiers are surviving now thanks to, uh, like I said, modern medicine and, and uh, technology. So these folks are, Young people are, are returning home. You know, they're trained, they're disciplined, they know what it's like to work on a team. You know, if you say, be here at, at um, 8 o'clock, 
So I was told last night to be in the lobby at 7.40 this morning. I was in the lobby at 7.40. Because <laughs> that's what soldiers do, you know. So, uh, so, so as a society, we can, we can make two, one of two choices. We can tap into that talent and make it part of the economic engine that makes this country great, or we can pay for it on the other end, on the social um, end of things. And in doing so with the latter, we, we really do not honor, honor their service. You can see why I was moved by his comments and by his perspective. Thank you. So Elaine. Um, one of the things that you already alluded to in your comments, and I think you and Amanda both have um, perspectives around, is that by hiring someone with a disability and supervising that individual, it changes how a supervisor supervises everyone. And I'd like you to talk about that, because I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, what we're really talking about here, and Lara's talking about, is providing um, universal access, universal culture, making the workplace welcoming for everybody. And when you do that, um, you know, you're making your staff happy. You're helping them do their jobs to the best of their ability. Um, there's a story um, of a manager I, I talked with at a recent conference that became a manager of somebody with a severe disability and he was very nervous. He had never worked with somebody with a severe disability before, but he had to learn how to listen and how to talk and how to meet the needs of that employee. And he was a supervisor of a team of 10 people. And he said, you know what? Supervising somebody with a disability all of a sudden made me a better manager. I realize now how to meet the needs of every single person on my team. You know, instead of, you know, this group management, he's really paying attention how everybody can do their job better and how to promote the people on his team. So, you know, return on investment happens for companies when disability becomes a centerpiece of corporate diversity. It's, as we talked about earlier, it's not, you know, just doing the right thing, but really it's doing it because it makes good business sense giving businesses a competitive edge. Thanks, Elaine. And Amanda, when we spoke, you had this absolutely amazing example of it that I'd like you to share. So we have an individual um, who works in a, one of our locations. And at the time that he onboarded, he came from one of our mock store programs. Um, and he skipped the internship piece and got hired right away, which is awesome. Uh, but at the time he started, just due to bad timing, it ended up that he didn't have a job coach right away to help him in the store. Um, so the team definitely helped him there, but he is so innovative that he just kind of came up with his own accommodation. Uh, and we do have a reasonable accommodation office, but he just kind of went in and came up with his own. And in this store, it just so happens the stock room is in the basement. So he decided that when he came into work each day, he would bring his iPad and he takes pictures of the out of stocks on the shelf. So he remembers when he goes into the basement exactly which items to pick up. And this practice is so cool because I would do that if I worked in the store. I mean, how many times have you gone to the kitchen to get something and you're like, I don't even remember what I just came in here for. And he just kind of thought of that on his own and did it one day and the manager completely adopted it and that's great. And he could even use the store's iPad now because we have one in the store. And that's something that it just, like Elaine said, it, it makes the manager a better leader. It turns them into just a manager, into a leader, because they're able to work with all individuals. And through working with an individual with a disability and seeing like how innovative they are and just making it work for them, they're able to take those practices for all of the other employees in the store, because they can help everyone. Wow, thank you so much. So we're, um, we have about a couple of minutes before we start to take questions. And before we do that, I wanted Larry um, to talk really specifically about the fact that the U.S. Small Business Administration is about the business of helping small business. And just imagine, given the fact that small business is the engine that really drives this country, just imagine if small businesses across the entire country made a concerted effort to hire people with disabilities, how that would change the employment rates. And so, Larry, in more of a truncated fashion that you and I had discussed, I wonder if you can talk about a couple of specific ways in which the US SBA is really driving small business hiring of people with disabilities. Okay, we're, it's, as uh, Lori just mentioned, SBA is in the business of supporting current uh, small business owners and uh, helping those who aspire to be business owners reach their goals and dreams. 
Um, my office, the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Civil Rights, I have a, a Title VII cell uh, of folks who work on the, the um, employment issues, and I also have folks who are uh, Title VI. And Title VI is um, non-discrimination, if you will, if, uh, if you're a recipient of federal uh, funding. So in 1980, the Congress uh, enacted uh, the Small Business Development Center law, which uh, has created small business development centers around the country. There's like about 70 of them. They're in all 50 states and U.S. territories. They're generally located on um, university and college campuses, and they're in the business of providing uh, management, managerial and technical assistance. They, they work with folks who uh, come in and they, they do training on marketing, you know, uh, financial planning, business, uh, developing business plans, and so forth. And these are their uh, uh, customers, if you will, are folks who are looking to go into to small business. So the Title VI folks that I have we do compliance reviews on those small business development centers, ensuring that that um, people with uh, individuals with disabilities have access to those centers. In other words, we go in and we make sure that they those centers have uh, plans to provide reasonable accommodations. We make sure that their websites and their uh, handouts and things of that nature are 508 compliant. You know, we, we work in terms of, uh, you know, folks with limited uh, English proficiency and, and so forth. So, so that's um, on the front end with, you know, folks who are interested in, in, uh, in the going into small business. And what we're going to do in, in the future we develop a, a strategic plan to, to create outreach. In other words, those small business development centers, like I said, are located all around the country and their doors are open for people who want to come. Our outreach efforts are going to be to go out, you know, to partner with, with uh, organizations such as FedCap and others to go out and, and encourage the, uh, you know, individuals with disabilities to think in terms of uh, you know uh, owning their own small business, so we like I said we have this uh, the, this uh, strategic plan. It was actually uh, created during the previous administration, and right now we're still in the process of bringing some of our political appointees on board. And as soon as we fully get up to, to uh, staff, we're going to present that plan to them, and then we hope to launch that plan you know, sometime early next year to, to uh, like I said, go out and, in, in, in other words, to get, to take that step further from just waiting for people to come to us, but to go out mm -hmm. and, like I, I said, it. to partner with organizations and so forth to encourage individuals with, with uh, disabilities to become business owners. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I have one more area to focus on with Elaine, but um, before I do that, I'm going to just make sure that we have time for questions, and then if we can go back, we'll go back. But um, in the audience, um, I have one question from, we have about 300 sites streaming across the country today. Um, actually, we have a site in London streaming in, too. So um, I have one question, and there may be more that come. But how from within the audience? Any um, thoughts or questions that you want to ask our panel? And we've got people with microphones around. Please. Um, my name is uh, Mary Jo Jacobs. I have four children, three of which have varying degrees of special needs and challenges. I've been very involved through our special education PTA in raising awareness as well as funds for 10 years. Um, now that I have a son who's 18 who's graduated from high school, I really find we're kind of falling a little bit into an abyss as far as what he gets to do next. So what I'm asking you, is there really a centralized repository for options and resources that we can tap? Um, and is there a job assessment that I can access online that helps us better focus that attention and energy? Um, I'm also hoping if this is streaming that I can send it to some of the parents that couldn't be here today and some nonprofits that I work with that I know. 
Excellent. It'll be on um, the FedCap website, um, if not tomorrow, the next day. So um, we'll make sure you have a, um, access to that. So panel, let's kind of zero in on two questions. Are you aware of a central, um, any kind of a central repository of information? And, and this may be to the audience, um, some form of assessment that can really drive employment. I, I can start with that. Too. Sure. Um, I think, unfortunately, there isn't one depository. Um, you know, the, the U.S. government has a website that you can go to for a lot of information. Every state has websites. Every county, um, a lot of counties have Office of Disability Services. Um, you have the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities that can provide a resource in New York City. Um, there's a lot of parent-to-parent -parent groups. Um, vocational rehabilitation um, in your state, you have access to your here. So, I mean, unfortunately, you know, as, as a parent, and, and I raise kids with disabilities, you have to go all over the place. Um, you're in the repository for whatever your particular areas, and each disability doesn't necessarily correlate to another. So there's, you know, if you have disability A, there's particular resource parent groups for that. If you have disability B, the same thing, and then there's cross disability groups. So it becomes a very complicated landscape. So the best thing is to find, um, you know, a, 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 an organization in your community that you can work with, whether it's state or private, and they can help you navigate. Um, I want to actually suggest that if there's organizations in the room today that might be able to help in that navigation, if you could reach out to our, um, our colleague here and um, let's help with the assessment piece and some of the other access pieces. Thank you for the question. Please. Other questions? Please, sir. Uh, so my name is Brian Gertler. I'm a senior vice president uh, in LDI Color Toolbox, a digital office technology company. And uh, my question is really directed to Amanda because I'm intrigued with your model. Uh, how amenable are the uh, schools that you went into to developing a technology, a digital office technology component or learning lab so that we could perhaps prepare um, the students that need to go into business uh, to be able to use um, mainstay digital office technology Great question. Uh, going forward. Yeah, thank you. Amanda. So I would say that um, not only the schools, I would say this, that particular school that we went to, and there are so many that we haven't gone to yet, that particular school was super advanced in just their thought process. They focus a lot on independent living um, and then work experience um, kind of like falls within that. I would say that a lot of the organizations that we work with personally, um, we see that with them, that they are going more towards like the digital era and what to prepare individuals for. So we work with um, Goodwill and AHRC and uh, services for the underserved and they're a lot, it's just a lot of organizations I would say that I would like refer to. Um, I think that the schools and District 75 in general, that it, it was pretty rare that we would find a school super advanced. I think all the schools are really trying, and I'm just being honest from a personal perspective, I think the schools are really trying to get there with just limited resources right now. Um, and there are so many sites. So uh, from a personal perspective, I would like to see, and I hope I do in the future, that there's more schools that are able to offer that. But I feel like right now there's probably a couple per borough. Great. I, I want to um, pose a question from our streamer. And the question really had to do with, um, from, a, from a culture change perspective, Get that from a culture change perspective, what um, if you were going to launch a new initiative tomorrow, or at least a series of initiatives tomorrow, where would you start? What would you think would be one of the most important things to do if you have not been an, a real advocate of, of hiring people with disabilities, but you wanted to be? Any member of the panel? Um, I would say just a suggestion I, or a thought. I would say that it would be really cool if, uh, I think that for schools like school some high schools and things offer like a STEM career day for students or an opportunity for students to go into multiple employers and visit multiple employers and hear about all the different careers out there and maybe be, maybe be paired up with a mentor. Um, and I find that in the disability world, I don't see too much of that. I would love to see something like that happen where individuals from um, you know a certain school are about to 
go into an organization or turning 18 that they have the opportunity to go into multiple different employers and just find what fits best for them and what, what their niche is. Thank uh, you. That I Thanks. Don't see all. Thanks, Elaine. Thank Thank you. Another there are two national organizations that have disability inventories that are applicable to corporations and a lot of corporations start with an assessment inventory of where they are at this point in time and work towards a growing. So I would say uh, there's also uh, under the workplace initiative on the web there is a DIY guide, a do-it-yourself guide for corporations to get started uh, that was designed by Poses Family Foundation, Kessler Foundation, a couple other foundations. It's really a good tool to look at where you are now and how to grow. Great. And Larry, you had one final comment that you would make to individuals around just really advancing the employment of people with disabilities. I would just say, uh, again, you know, going back to our managers and supervisors and HR folks, I, I think we, we need to change the culture in terms of how we, how we view, you know, working and serving with folks with uh, disabilities. But, I, but I'll leave you with a thought that someone left me years ago. I was at a, a, a disability uh, employment awareness luncheon, and the speaker said, you know, that any one of us is, you know, one illness or one accident away from being disabled. And we, would, we certainly enjoy the privileges of employment now, and, we, and if something, you know, God forbid, was to happen to us, we would still want to enjoy those, those privileges. Mm, thank you. Thank you, and I want to ask you all to join me in thanking our panel for their insight and perspectives. Thank you. Thank you all of you so much. And now Christine McMahon, our CEO, will come and close us out. What a great, what a great discussion. Thank you. Um, but thank you, Lori, also for your great work in this panel. She puts a lot of work in this. Please give Lori a round of applause for her. <laughs> I want to, um, you know, just to end with two quick thoughts. You know, we heard an, uh, just an enormous amount of valuable information today. It's really quite inspiring. And let me just end with two things. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity, I'm going back maybe two decades now, I had the opportunity to sit in a room and listen to uh, an Olympic athlete talk about her experience. She was in the Paralympics and described growing up in the most loving, encouraging family, the most loving and encouraging school district. And she said, you know, if you had put, uh, and one of uh, four children, she was the only girl, and this may have had something to do with the, the point, but she said, you know, if you had asked my teachers and my family, all of whom were so loving and dedicated, um, one of your children were, was gonna grow up and be an Olympic athlete, they would never have picked her. They would, that she would not have been among the people that they all collectively chose. And I, uh, I had another experience some years later, much more recently, in which we were trying to persuade a group of parents to uh, uh, take that step with their uh, adult child and allow them to sort of take a risk and go into an employment situation from mo maybe almost a decade of, in, in sheltered work. And the parents said to me, and I've spent the last 22 years of my life protecting my child, my son, and I didn't want, I don't want, you know, you're asking me now to step aside and let him risk failure? And I said, yes. <laughs> so, so two points. One, you know, we all uh, have an opportunity to question the systems. The very systems that support people with disabilities can sometimes be those systems that reinforce over and over again uh, that greatness is not a possibility. And each one of us, Every single day, we all live in a community, we all work somewhere, we all have a family, we have a chance every single day to aspire, to help a person with disabilities aspire to greatness. It doesn't take much, just help people aspire to greatness. And I think, you know, underneath it all, um, that it can really be a powerful tool and, and as, we, as we go through life in our communities, in our homes, in our schools, in our organizations, to just make sure that each step of the way we are aspiring for greatness for all of the people that we come in contact with. So with that, I thank you very much uh, for your attention this morning and um, see you next at the next Solution Series. Thank you.